Thank you so much for coming out to Center for Photography at Woodstock, now in Kingston. Um, my name is Sarah Danziger. I'm the education coordinator here at CPW. Um, tonight, uh, for Meet the Artist, every Thursday we have Meet the Artist. Tonight we're, we're really lucky to be joined by three incredible women, uh, Leslie deschler Canasi, Zareta lopez Diago, and Kiana Mestrich. I believe we're gonna start out with Kiana, so I'm gonna read a little bit of her bio. Uh, Kiana Mestrich uh, is a photography-focused interdisciplinary artist, writer, and mother working in between Brooklyn and Saugerties, New York. Working primarily within autobiography, Mestrich's research-led practice explores personal and public archives to investigate black mixed race identity for her, from her perspective as a first-generation American. Knowledge sharing and community building is a vital part of Messages' practice. In 2007, she founded Dodge and Burn, Decolonizing Photography History, established in 2007, an arts initiative that aims to diversify the medium's history by advocating for photographers of color. Dodge and Burn began as a blog and from 2014 to 2022 functioned as a monthly critique group meeting in person and virtually. Her forthcoming book based on the blog's past interviews will be published by Routledge, Taylor and Francis. Uh, Kiana is also included in this wonderful book, Black Matrilineage Photography and Representation, which was co-created by Leslie and Zareta. Can we welcome, uh, warm welcome for Kiana? Hi everyone, thanks for coming out. It's so great to be here. Let's get started. So we're at the, the format for tonight is gonna be, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about my work and then um, Zoretta and Leslie will present um, about their organization, Women Printing Revolution, as well as the book that Sarah just mentioned. And then we'll have a little, a little bit of a Q&A afterwards with the three of us. All right, so before I kind of get into my work, I really kind of wanted to talk a little bit about sort of early photographic encounters of uh, black motherhood and matrilineage, personally, um, starting with my own family archive. Um, you know, this is a picture of my mom and me at eight months old and my first trip to Panama. She is from Panama, Central America. Um, and she raised me as a single mother in New York City in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I bring this picture up just to say, and I think a lot of the subsequent pictures of mothers that you'll see are also just images of mothers with their children. But um, for me, looking at my family archive over the years, you know, the question of like, what did single black motherhood look like within my own family archive always came up. Um, and this is a picture that I hold dear. Also thinking about sort of mid-century representations of black motherhood through the lens of a non-black photographer. Consuelo Canaga is one of my all-time favorite black and white uh, photographers. Uh, for those of you who don't know her, she was an American-born Swiss photo uh, photographer of Swiss heritage, um, who like her better known contemporary Dorothea Lange, worked as a photojournalist from 1915 to the 60s. This is, I love this image. Um, I love the child's look and gaze upon his mother. I'll show you a couple more images of Consuelos. This is titled, She is a Tree of Life to Them. Um, and this is image from 1950. Uh, Consuelo examines the role of mother as a protector. So you can see sort of the mom here is kind of, you know, holding her children really close, um, but the children's faces are, are fairly obscured, so we're, our eye kind of is really drawn to um, the mother herself. Um, and she's depicted from this kind of low vantage point, which further accentuates her strength and um, asserting the sort of fierce protection of her children. But for me, this image kind of really deserves further discussion and investigation in light of contemporary conversations around self-care and this kind of archetype of the strong black woman. Um, the strong black woman archetype describes a cultural pattern where black women are expected to present um, as physically and mentally strong, regardless of past and ongoing stressors. The strong black woman archetype has served the historical purpose of aiding survival for black women throughout years of racial and gender oppression. However, 
The practice has also been associated with adverse mental health and with behaviors as they are expected to selflessly need meet the needs of their family and community, and as such may embrace self-silencing in their interpersonal relationships. This is another um, beautiful image um, from Consuelo Kanaga. Um, her work is really unique uh, because at this time she was really drawn to depicting African Americans. Um, but I feel like her view and her perspective is one of joy for the most part. Um, and she, um, you know, in a statement of work, she said she simply tried to show the beauty of black people. And she didn't necessarily care for showing context, which is why a lot of these images are so closely cropped and shot. Um, and she really wanted to engage the viewer by taking pictures of their faces close up. Um, and she was taught by Stieglitz, um, but didn't just rely on in-camera composition and often reworked her prints tirelessly by cropping and manipulating tonal values to achieve her aesthetic vision. And I think that sort of tonal uh, investigation in the darkroom also benefited her, you know, photographing darker skinned people who, as we you know, because as we know, photography chemistry was not um, created with darker skinned people in mind. Moving on to another image that I love. Um, sorry, Leslie, you're I'm totally blocked. But um, I love to kind of think about motherhood in the in the sense of looking at it from a historical event like segregation. Um, what does black motherhood look like in this time period? This is an image from Ruth Orkin from an early series of her New York photojournalism work. Not sure where that noise is coming from. Maybe in the window. Uh, she photographed, or Orkin photographed train passengers waiting outside of Manhattan's Pennsylvania station. This image of a black mother and child sitting on their luggage reflects the little discussed history of segregated transportation in Northern United States. Through the 1940s, Penn Station officials often assigned black travelers seats in Jim Crow cars on southbound trains. And looking at yet, yeah, some of you might be familiar with this image. Um, but looking again at, you know, sort of Gordon Parks' work um, around segregation as well. This is from his series, Segregation Stories. Um, thinking about, you know, the interior lives of black mothers and their children, how do they explain things like racial inequality and ill treatment um, in a society that was, you know, sort of against them simply based on their skin color? How do they talk about topics like colorism and passing or perhaps the erasure, or erasure of indigenous heritage amongst their own families. Um, so th would an image like this kind of makes me think of that, just simply as being as a mother myself and thinking about all of the things that we have to constantly explain to our children about how life is and their place in the world socially. Um, I think we really can kind of look at photography and photographs of black mothers in particular um, when we're discussing these questions or evaluating these questions. Um, this is Clarissa Sai, um, and sort of uh, she's reevaluating re motherhood in her own family album. This is from a series called Reframing the Past um, that she did over a period of 10 years, 1994 to 1994. Um, could also be titled Rereading the Family Album. From 1984 to 1994, Sly's work centered on reinvestigation and reevaluation of her family photo album. Growing up in the blue collar black neighborhood of Halls Hill in Arlington, Virginia in the 1950s, keeping up the family album was something the artist took great pride in, not realizing that her early family album project was created through the lens of a stereotypical white American family. She saw the project as making a record of positive images of her black family. Um, and as we see here, um, she's taking this sort of family album image, but also rewritten over it some um, her own narrative, which is a really interesting kind of combination of text and photography that and I feel like Clarissa is also really not very well known um, within photography history. Um, so I hope that, you know, we can rediscover her work. This is um, an, an image that um, I really love. I Back when I was a teenager, I interned at uh, Jack Tilton Gallery, which at the time was based in Soho. 
in New York City. Um, and so this image is from, it's by Lyle Eston Harris, who I believe is also an upstate New York res resident now. Um, this is a series of 20 by 24 inch dye diffusion Polaroids interspersed with cibachrome prints, reproducing a selection of images from his family's photo archives comprised Harris's first solo, as, solo exhibition in 1994. So I got to see these close up as an intern um, during his solo exhibition at Jack Tilton Gallery. Writing in black art and culture in the 20th century, Richard Powell described this work as, quote, a complete version of various notions of identity, gender, sexual, and familial, which ironically caused another indicator of identity, blackness, to twist, snake, and splice itself into a complex yet irreducible ingredient, unquote. Um, and what's great about this is that the, quote, unquote, father, uh, or male sort of character in the picture is another photographer, Renee Cox, and they're holding um, Renee's one of Renee's sons, and that is um, Lyle Ashton Harris as well on the right. Um, how do we consider transcultural motherhood? Um, this is a, one of my favorite um, artists, photographic artists for sure. Um, Maria Magdalena Los Campos, and um, you know, she says here about this work, my subjects are often my Afro-Cuban relatives as well as myself. My themes are cross-cultural and cross-generational. Race and gender expressed in symbols of matriarchy and maternity are thematic ideas. Um, and this, her, her work is incredible. She also works in large format Polaroid um, in this sort of very um, grid format. Um, and this is uh, one of, I believe it's her grandmother, one of her matriarchs in her family. But I really love this sort of, you know, string tied here in between them, sort of this, you know, these maternal connections, these familial connections, both expressed physically and um, thematically in the work. So now I'll go into talking about um, some of my own work. This is a series that I self-published as a book in 2016 called Heart to Place. Heart to Place is a true story about race, family, and the child welfare system in post-war Britain, combining confidential government documentation, archival, and autobiographical photography. This series illustrates the childhood of Joseph, an orphan boy of Nigerian and Irish parentage growing up in 1960s and 70s London. I self-funded and published Hard to Place in 2016 as a paperback photography book. The book's first spread features a portrait of Joseph's father on the left and his mother on the right. I chose the book form to represent this series in direct relation to the family album or scrapbook, mediums meant to preserve memories. For many, like Joseph, these personal family archives are non-existent or incomplete. The interracial pairing of Joseph's parents was important to create it as a common type of photograph found in family albums. This coupling preserved in photographic emotion has been a constant in the history of the medium, so much so that people who've been raised by both parents often take this kind of photograph for granted, not realizing how many people worldwide do not have this visual affirmation of the love that created them. I don't know why Joseph's parents were never photographed together, but I do recognize the power of this formal arrangement, specifically in the shaping of a mixed race identity. As a half caste child in England, Joseph was considered hard to place, quote unquote, amongst the mostly white adoptive families. Consequently, Joseph was placed in care eight different times from ages three to 17. This is a quote, um, that was written by um, Dr. Alexandrina Agloro about the work. It reads, the title Heart to Place references the difficulty of placing Joseph in adoption because of his mixed heritage, but also the title alludes to the physical ambiguity of the multiracial body. What are you is a frequent question a mixed body hears because the ways our bodies present themselves to make us hard to place as well. Joseph is my husband. On our first date, he nervously told me his life story, continuously pulling at his sleeves to hide the ink of bad decisions made during his teenage years as a black skinhead. The little boy in the color documentary images seen in Heart to Place is our son. 
My lens has captured tender, curious, and mundane moments in our home, along with some other more emotional family situations. In these images, our son often becomes that precocious yet lonely little boy I imagine his father was as a child. Hard to Place began in 2013 when under the United Kingdom's Data Protection Act of 1998, Joseph received two legal-sized books stuffed with photocopied files documenting the years he had spent as an orphan. It wasn't until late 2015 that I began pairing my own documentary images with this confidential text, the goal being to provide a visual art alternative to this official narrative of Joseph's childhood. Um, and what you see here uh, in the text is an article that was written as a last ditch attempt to get Joseph adopted. Um, and it says, little Joe needs love and care. And it goes on to talk about how, um, you know, children who are orphans have all of these um, handicaps, but it says, what constitutes a handicap? Mental retardation and physical disability, of course, but if a child is black or if of mixed race, then that is a handicap too. The documents he received from the London Borough of Camden included typed and handwritten text authored by social workers observing both Joseph and his mother Mara, AKA Maureen, who often, often needed financial and housing assistance. In some cases, I've left the text as is. Other times, I've reworked the text in poem form to highlight the detached tone and the clinical observatory nature of the situation. Um, here, this is kind of text describing Joseph's mother, Maureen. It says, Maureen has an unstable Irish temperament, personality disorder, lives with Joe, nearly seven, half caste in council accommodation. She is not very intelligent and finds life hard, her, consequen her consequential loneliness. The archival images show Maureen as a vibrant woman, despite the inner and outer struggles she endured living as a single Irish woman with a black child in a former colonial empire. Using my own documentary images, I try to represent a or the mother in this story, cultivating and practicing a compassion for a mother-in-law that I've never known. The dominant narrative of mixed race orphans is that they are all born of wars, the product of illicit love affairs or rapes between women and the soldiers that occupied their countries. Some popular examples of these quote unquote occupation babies include those born during post World War II in Japan and during the Korean War. It's interesting to note that although white soldiers fathered children often at higher rates, the offspring of black soldiers were far more ostracized. The orphan is a common human archetype. They have been many notable celebrities, world leaders, figures within classical history and religious scripture in literature, even comic book heroes who began life as orphans. Yet there has been very little within popular culture, international news or the arts about ordinary children made orphan because of the strain of historical and everyday racist conditions. We don't often hear of the children abandoned by one or both parents because of the stress of discrimination from society and their respective family members that has fractured their unions. What of these children made orphan under the strain of historical racism and post-colonial conditions in the Western world? And the text here reads, he wants to be fostered by a black family, would feel, quote, the odd one out with a white family she verbally abused him on Sunday by calling him black shit. <laughs> Alone and marginalized, these children bear the intolerable weight of their parents' failed loves and that of mankind's dark, unsettled history with the constructs of race. This is another quote by um, curator Paula Kufer, who wrote about this work as well. She says, the different visual elements in Hard to Place convey that it is a difficult and deeply personal story to tell and understood and understand when that would inevitably have some gaps. And now I'll talk about Thrall. This is the last series that I'll speak about. Um, this was a series that um, I sort of 
began pre-pandemic and also continued during the pandemic as well. Um, it's a series that sort of works when I'm working with my children um, and my husband as well um, in a really sort of domestic studio environment as well as kind of an open air studio environment. Um, certainly there's a lot of meaning behind a lot of the objects used. A lot of the objects used are very personal. Um, but I think there's also, for me, an emphasis on aesthetics and uh, certainly working within a particular color palette. Um, there's also a lot in this work in terms of um, referencing and being in conversation with uh, photographers that I admire, uh, photographers, I'm, I'm a sort of voracious um, reader and absorber of photography history, love reading about people who have come before me in photography. Um, for example, this is titled Oja Seca after Flor Galduño. Um, there's a picture that Flor has. Um, I thought I had it in the slideshow, but um, there's a picture that she has of a woman just taking cover in, this, in the studio and she's underneath this massive leaf. Um, and, you know, kind of in the editing of this work, I came to realize that there were a lot of these images are sort of burnt in my mind, a lot of these images that I've loved over the years, and, and they kind of slowly seep their way into, into my work as well. This image is titled Strange Bush. Um, hair is a big subject for me <laughs> in general, and I think um, uh, as a black mother, as a woman of color, hair is is just part of my identity. It's something that we we have to constantly deal with in in one way or another, um, and more so once you have children and have children have different textured hair from you. Um, we have like a hair basket at home with all of our hair accoutrements to deal with our hair. My children have two different types of hair texture than I do. Um, this particular image I made using my son's hair and it was after his first haircut. And, um, you know, I was just, I've always had this, and I think it's passed down in my family too, I've always had this sort of suspicion of like someone having your hair after a haircut. Um, that something, you know, could be done with it to, you know, something nefarious could be done with it. So I kept his hair and I still keep my children's hair. Um, but, you know, this sort of title, um, Strange Bush, is kind of a riff on, you know, the, the popular song, Billie Holiday song, Strange Fruit, but also referencing um, a lot of the internal dialogue within my family about hair as well and um, a lot of criticism within my family in particular about um, how hair is kept and how it's neat and how it's presentable and how it's respectable and all of that conversation. So I think all of the, all of the musings of all of those conversations could have, were channeled into the making of this image, particular image. I feel like this series almost sort of began with this image. Um, this was a, a classical Greek statue that was on view and it's hard, it's really washed out here, but it is um, very washed out in the, in the photograph as well. Um, it's called Pandora's Misfortune. It's a statue of Pandora and she's holding the box of the world's evils, right? As in the story, she's, Pandora is the Greek goddess who unleashed the world's evils onto the world because she was so curious. Um, but this image, you know, when I came across this sculpture in the museum, it was, just during a regular family trip to the Brooklyn Museum. And then I got off on the second floor and there was this sculpture in front of this gleaming window light. Um, and for me, it was just like this reminder of, you know, just these standards of beauty that we see every day in our cultural institutions. And the Brooklyn Museum has changed quite a bit since then in terms of who they represent and what they show. Um, they, they've they done a really great job of mixing in a lot of their classical and sort of ancient paintings and architecture in with a lot of more contemporary works, which I think is a great way to sort of bring people in, bring you know your average person into uh, this really institutional museum space. But um, yeah, for me, this image is, is certainly a critique of white spaces that uphold white standards of beauty. This one's called Civilization's Dark Tendencies. 
So a lot of the images in here show me kind of playing with my children, allowing them to play. I have to photograph really quickly when I'm photographing my children, as anybody who's photographed children knows. Um, oftentimes don't even know what I'm getting in the end. Um, but, you know, here is an, uh, an image where you see some wishbones and wishbones in my family um, are sort of symbolic of my mother. And my mother is not in this series. Um, she's the only surviving grandparent um, in our family for my children. Uh, but this is kind of my way of putting her into the work because she gifted these wishbones and she still continues to gift wishbones to my children, thinking that they will make something out of them, some sort of arts or crafts piece out of them. Um, and here you see the wishbones again in this image. Um, it's called the right to wear, to wear, wear war. Excuse me, that's kind of a tongue twister. But the wishbones here are kind of you know, symbolic of um, medals and medallions that would be worn um, in a military jacket or a military officer's jacket. Um, so my son in the middle of a dance called the Orange Justice, which some of you may or may not know. <laughs> See some of the younger people in the audience smirking. Um, but yeah, I've, I've shown this piece as well as sort of a grid um, kind of Moybridge style to sort of show the the motion that goes into this this dance. But this was like the first time where he really got a dance down, like a popular dance down. So he was just so psyched. Um, and uh, yeah, this was made up state here in Socrates. This one's called Camouflage. I don't know if you can see, but um, I, I started making the, these backdrops as part of this series um just out of necessity you know i feel like mothers are just masters at making something out of nothing and um in everyday life and for me you know i i didn't have access or couldn't afford at that time um studio backdrop paper um and so i just start, started i took this brown craft paper um that i got at home depot and started making my own backdrops and took black spray paint and was kind of pulling up some of the weeds in our yard and started, you know, kind of making this um, sort of almost, almost like a cyanotype, but not. It's not cyanotype because it's, there's no light involved. There's no chemistry involved, but um, it sort of has that effect. Um, and then just in taking this picture, um, a moth, which we have many of, <laughs> um, just landed on the, the paper and I thought it was just sort of beautiful how the colors totally mixed and matched the um, the paper that I was making. This one's titled Not Coming Back Whole. Um, kind of references an October Butler story um, where the, the main character is sort of crossing between worlds and at one point her, her limbs get stuck in the walls. This one's called Aperture. Again, a lot of the objects used in um, the series are sort of personal objects. This is a Kari shell um, that I've had for years, um, symbolic of many different things culturally. Um, you know, it's Bitkaris have been used as currency in many cultures, um, also used in African diaspora religious, uh, religious rituals and ceremony. Um, but here I really kind of looking at it as sort of a third eye or sort of a portal. And that is my last image. Thank you so much. We can leave it for afterwards, yeah. You guys wanna go here? Thank you, Kiana, that was wonderful. Uh, we were really lucky to have some of those images uh, by a, a show that Kiana had curated here that also included Zareta's work, so it was nice to hear you speak about them. Um, okay, so next we're gonna have Leslie and Zareta come up. I will read each of their bios real quick. Leslie deschler Kanasi is a photography educator and facilitator. She holds an MFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art. 
Her research aims to reframe the history of photography, better reflecting a story of innovation that includes women. She is interested in creating conversations in support of deep creativity and representational justice. In 2016, she co-founded Women Picturing Revolution, an organization dedicated to women identifying photographers who have documented conflicts and crisis in private realms and public spaces. She co-edited Black Matrilineage Photography and Representation, Another Way of Knowing, her personal and teaching practice centers on themes of care, mothering, and grief. Her course, Into the Fold, Mother Artist Identity, which explores artist-parent identity through lens and performance-based work, was for the first of its kind offered at a major photographic institution. Leslie is a faculty member at the International Center of Photography, and for over 14 years, Leslie ran Fiber Inc. Studio, printing from some of the world's greatest, printing for some of the world's greatest artists and institutions from emerging the high profile. Her expertise includes silver gelatin, analog type C and wide format pigment printing. Leslie lives in Beacon, New York with her family on a mini homestead that includes honeybees. <laughs> um, Zareda Lopez Diago is a photographer, curator and activist. She is committed to centering the voices and histories of people from the African diaspora. Uh, with a particular focus on themes of gender, incarceration, migration, and climate change. Zareda has exhibited at institutions throughout the Americas and has lectured about her work at institutions including Harvard U University, the Tate Modern, and La Universidad de Antioquia, Colombia, among others. <laughs> In, 2020, 20, uh, in 2022, she co-curated Picturing Black Girlhood, an exhibition exploring black girlhood that included more than 80 black women, girls, and genderqueer artists photo working in photography and film. To date, this was the largest exhibition on black girls in the world. In 20,000 square feet? Wow. In 2016, Zareda co-founded Women Picturing Revolution and through this project co-edited Black Matrilineage Photography and Representation, Another Way of Knowing. Um, Zarita is an environmental activist and is the co-founder of Conservationists of Color, a national platform for people of color working in the land conservation movement. She serves as twice vice president of communications develop and development and strategic partnership at the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming. Zareda also lives in Beacon with her husband and two sons and in her spare time she enjoys long walks in the woods. Same. <laughs> Please give a warm welcome to Leslie and Zareda. Sorry. Okay. And one more thing. Full screen mode. Okay. So all you have to do is. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for the kind invitation and following you, Kiana, is really quite an honor. And thank you, CPW, as well. We're excited to be here. And we should say that actually this hot little thing they worked on for five years, this is the first time a public talk we've actually had it in our hands. So we'll indulge a little bit of reading as yeah. well with that. All right. <laughs> um, so um, we'll talk a little bit about um, Women Picture Revolution, how we got started. And then we'll go into sharing um, some work and some readings from the book. Exactly. Do we start? All right. So just briefly, um, Women Fiction Revolution, we, we got together in about 2016. Um, so Zaretta and I met um, years prior. We were living in the city, and I'm a printer, as mentioned. And I think we met because you were in a, a group show. Yep. And um, someone gave my name and we just met and immediately started talking about photography. We met on the, you know, the stone staircase outside the old ICP building and just ended up talking more about old photography and, and history of photography. Um, so we met in that way. And then very quickly, we just, uh, that was, I was, I'm not sure who came to Beacon first. I can't remember. I we connected through motherhood. Um, that's a whole other story about that idea of um, being a mother artist, um, supporting one another, uh, we exchanged a lot of conversations and, and items around that. But um, in 2016, just having so many conversations about photography over the dinner table, and we just decided that we really wanted to do something together to highlight the work of female identifying photographers, specifically who are working in conflict. So conflict could be described as 
uh, both photojournalism and documentary practices, but also very personal work, um, deeply personal work. So that's kind of where we started out with Women Picturing Revolution. Mm -hmm. So um, here are just um, a few examples of some of the classes and workshops that Leslie and I taught. Um, we were so lucky to be able to um, Skype in Chaldea, a young woman at the Zatari refugee camp in 2016. This was the largest refugee camp in the world. <clears throat> and Chaldea was working um, with Laura Dodgett. She has a project called Another Kind of Girl Collective and Chaldea made a short film. It was featured in Sundance, LA Film Festivals, um, New York Film Festivals, and no one ever thought of Skyping her in to talk about her work. And so Leslie and I were so fortunate to be able to Skype Chaldea in from the, the, the Zatari refugee camp um, to tell us about her process and how she made the work and mm -hmm. how she made her film and, and why she made it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So at that time, we were just proposing workshops to various institutions and really kind of created something that we didn't see out there in the world that we wanted. You know, sometimes you just create things that you want to see in the world. I believe this is also the same seminar that Sheila P. Bright came in, mm -hmm. which was r really just so exciting. So small groups, um, really getting to conversation with participants, really highlighting the work. Um, and then we were speaking to Keanu about, you know, how to frame this. And it was who were some key artists that inspired the work and also some publications. So we'll cover that as well. And, you know, prior to Women uh, Picturing Revolution coming together, Ken and I co-curated a show at her studio place, Women as Witness. And um, I just, you know, had to jot a little note, Keanu, when you said making something out of nothing. And this show was, would not have happened without Kiana. Um, she, it's true. Kiana, you know, opened her space. We co-curated a show that had women who were documenting war from all over the world. <clears throat> and Leslie graciously printed the work for photographers who couldn't ship their work to the to the U.S. And one of the artists was this woman, Heba, who was documenting the, um, the Arab Spring from inside her home in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Right, and we saw these images, or when I saw these images, you had already encountered them. Um, from, if I remember correctly, she spoke a lot about the raw experience of motherhood and also not being able to be out in the street because of being a mother for her safety. And that just really, that really touched us quite a bit, really resonated. It was, um, I believe this is 2000, I can't remember exact date, but a lot of things were happening right around that time. Uh, so this work is one that just always motivated and stuck with us. And then just briefly, um, so you understand the structure of the WPR, you know, kind of interest in courses, there's about five or six key issues that we cover and talk about. So within each of these sections, there's like a series of artists that we either bring in or talk about their work or get into conversation, migration, displacement, gender-based violence, landscapes of war, environmental degradation and climate change, Education. This is one of Sheila's images, Revolution Reclamation. So we're working for a couple of years together. Uh, it was really lovely doing different classes around. And one of the books I think we have here leads into the Columbia. Yeah, I mean, a book in the show that really, I think for a lot of women artists, black women artists, was the We Wanted a Revolution um, show at Brooklyn Museum that was curated by Catherine Morris and Rujek Lockley. And I mean, this, you know, I'm sure everyone in this room like has the show that really just kind of cracked things open. And that show that focused on second wave black feminism, um, I think really opened up how we were thinking about Mothering, motherhood, mm -hmm. mother artists, creating something out of nothing, and um, just the communities that women were creating to support each other to make work. 
Exactly, exactly. Um, and also just as a, a book format, it's, it's obviously very different than this, but there's a, a book about the show, but there's also a source book, which has become one of our kind of go-to books, but also a dream of ours is to have a source book mm -hmm. of this way about, so like everything mentioned in this book, then there's a source book to accompany it. It's just a phenomenal um, piece of research here. And also just lifting, um, as Zoraida said, the idea of, you know, artists at this time uh, working, you know, creating daycare for one another, you know, um, basically what we come to call mutual aid was existing in such a strong way in this community of artists, of great artists. And at this time, um, you were at Iris? Yeah, I was at Columbia um, University as a consultant in African-American studies. And, you know, they heard me coming every week talking about WPR and our classes. And um, the former president, Dr. Samuel Roberts, Said, why don't you teach something here? Mm -hmm. And Leslie and I said, okay, let's focus sure. on. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Let's focus on uh, Black women photographers. And we taught this really incredible um, one-day seminar to a room full of a room full of um, women that were interested. And the two guests that we had were Nona Hostine and Ayanna B. Jackson. Mm -hmm. So Ayanna B. Jackson um, was one of the guest artists who came in, and we reference her quite a bit in the intro of the book. Something she talks about is fighting photography with photography. So just briefly, um, this is Ayanna's a, a portrait. Uh, this is herself on the right and a family portrait. So she spoke about um, growing up in New Jersey and, and going down the stairs and seeing all these wonderful multi-generational photographs of her family. And she calls her grandmother, um, her bougie grandmother. Um, and just knowing that she has a history and this beautiful family legacy that she could see in photographs um, and that that was not reflected in the media, right? So it's, she was creating her own kind of archive in a way. Uh, she spoke so deeply about her her work, um, her many bodies of work, but it was always this theme leading back to this uh, matrilineal, you know, looking back, talking about uh, multi-generational language of mother. So it was something that just started coming up in the class. And then of course, Nona Faustin, who we've worked so closely with over the years, um, talked about so much about her work. These are self-portraits. Uh, this is Nona on the right, her daughter, and on the left, her mother and her daughter, Queen. Uh, so Nona's work, probably you've known about Nona's work, but also, again, very much self-portraiture, um, her mother, her sister, her daughter. This was a very strong thread. And then in her, her language of her speak, um, talk was, again, about this um, connection, this long connection between the matrilineal line, uh, knowing and unknowing. That was just so strong in that class, in that seminar. Yeah, and I think you see that in Nona's work, even, you know, the title of the series being mitochondria. Exactly. Like you, you feel the weight of the lineage of, um, of Black mothering and Black motherhood being extended beyond her and her family, but something that's kind of rooted much uh, deeper, stretching, like, time mm -hmm. space. Yeah, that was a really, really special room. It was one of those rooms where everybody was, you know, in conversation. It was a long day. We got very, very close, went out afterwards. Um, and it was really something special. So what was wonderful is a, a, a few weeks later, we yeah. got an email from... Yeah, so um, at Colonia, I got an email from Leuven Press, this press in Belgium that, you know, Leslie and I had no... We were thinking about a book, but I got an email. Um saying, would you be interested in pitching a book to Lumen Press? And um, we we spoke about it and we said, okay, what, are, what would we pitch a book on? And um, after that workshop at Columbia, the themes of focusing on black mothering and black motherhood just kind of made sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the book is, uh, an, it's an academic press out of Belgium and it's, uh, uh, we did an open call, but we also reached out directly to folks and folks found us. Uh, there is a series of academic essays. There's a poem. Uh, there's also, it was really important for us to not only have, you know, people that are really accustomed to this kind of format, but also emerging voices. We really wanted to crack open and, and break open that academic kind of uh, format. So um, the book is uh, archival images, contemporary images, uh, digital culture, self-portraiture. But in the back of the book, we curated, we held that space for ourselves to curate, um, I think, 30-some images in color. Mm -hmm. 
So this is just showing you a couple of spreads. We wrote the introduction. Um, we edited, we worked with all the essayists and edited the essays, um, which was a really, it was a great process. Um, and I think we really, in addition to forming relationships with the artists in the book, just really formed nice relationships um, with the essays, essays in the book. And as Le Leslie mentioned, you know, I think we really wanted to call into question in the academic press who's considered an expert. All too often, Black people, mm -hmm. Black mothers in particular, are not considered the experts of our, of our bodies, right? And we're seeing that now in this country. You know, women mm -hmm. were not considered um, autonomous and experts to make decisions about our bodies. Um, and we wanted to shift that in a bit. So there are essays in the book who are considered untraditional. We were just so lucky to have them contribute mm -hmm. and to have a press that was open to, to even who we are. We're not professors. Um, <laughs> in the traditional sense. The traditional right. sense. Yeah. Um, so the book was about five years um, because a lot happened in between. Um, would you like to, I mean, I everything, a baby. But, well, that a was baby. one. Yeah. That was the best one. COVID. COVID, the America's racial, racial reckoning, um, and, and a lot of emphasis on black maternal health mm -hmm. and maternal mortality was coming to the light. So just a lot of things. So this was really, as you all know, it's like late nights, early mornings, lots of emails. Crazy took, took a long time. So thank you, Leuven, uh, for your patience, uh, if you're listening. Um, and then we just wanted to share briefly before we get into indi individual artists and the color plates, um, just again, another edition of the, uh, showing the spread. We're very proud of the um, contributing artist list. Everyone said yes. Everyone said yes. Yeah. Everyone's been so patient. Thank you, Kiana. <laughs> <laughs> and then just a quick give you an idea of over 40 um, international contributors. And then I think what we'd like to do is read a little bit from the book, if you all don't mind. And we chose to begin with a section in the intro that talks a little bit about Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass. And I, you know, we both thought Sojourner Truth was, was so important to thinking about like Kingston, the history of the land in this place and the relationships that Sojourner Truth has to this area in particular. It was just really nice to start, um, start our reading with her. So I'll, I'll begin. The link between photography, representation, and black activism can be traced back to the early days of the medium when prominent abolitionists and orators, Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass understood how images could mold narratives. Both Truth and Douglas knew that through photography, they could engage in what scholar Lee Rayford, Lee Rayford calls critical black memory, or how photography could serve as an important research re resource for framing and mobilizing African-American social movements. Douglas frequently wrote about photography and deeply understood how it could serve as a necessary tool for Black people across the globe to be seen and represented as fully human. With this in mind, he demonstrated what Black freedom and dignity looked like, confident, in control, and unafraid. When he posed throughout his lifetime and became the most photographed person of the 19th century. Fellow abolitionist, women's rights activist, and orator Sojourner Truth sold carte de visite or small size photographs often mounted on cardboard, which included the phrase, I sell the shadow to support the substance, Sojourner Truth, at her lectures to earn a living. As she became increasingly popular, Truth shrewdly registered her carte de visite as engravings and in turn legally owned the copyright of her own image in her etching. Upon this, Truth reflected that she used to be sold for other people's benefit, but now she sold herself for her own. This act of re-envisioning how we see and make images is one in which Black female artists are tethered to the matrilineal precursors. And as this connection cannot is, I'm sorry, this connection is not rooted in a legacy filled with guilt and burden, but rather full of devotion and love. 
Black women and artists bind themselves together in this manner to continue the quest for Black freedom, ensure their histories are not forgotten, and bring forward the spirit of their ancestors, both familial and artistic. So, and the images we're sharing are throughout the book in different different capacities. The um, the images of children are um, images we asked some of the essayists and, and artists to provide if their work referenced their childhood. Uh, how do Black women artists hear the calls? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I just read that. I read that. No. No. Okay. Thank you. Hi. How do Black women artists hear the calls of their uh, maternal bonds, both living and dead? The whispers from the motherland spoken in a mother tongue. What do their answers look like? A visual exploration of Black motherhood through pictures made by Black female-identifying photographers serves as a response to the call a reflection of the past and a portal to the future. While there's no one story told by these artists, there's a thread or cord of sorts that connects their images and brings material reality of what cannot be seen, but rather felt. In this, these artists begin to fill the gaps of representation of black mothers and mothering of what Audre Lorde named the erotic or quote, the assertion of the life force of women of that creative energy empowered the knowledge and use of which we are now reclaiming in our language, our history, our dancing, our loving, our work, and our lives. This act of knowing is often told in the secret language passed between mothers, daughters, kin, and defies time as seen in the works of Lei Hong. <laughs> Delphine. Keisha Scarville, and Marcia Michael, who reminds us that we search for our mothers in order to find ourselves. Artist Nadia Blas reveals a visual meditation that is delicately spun into a mythical allegory, allegory with young Black women and girls fulfilling the roles of mothers, warriors, sirens, and saints. Photographer, writer, and curator Kiana Mestrick continues this repositioning of Black women and Black motherhood in particular by properly placing them as the original makers and their children as collaborators with both, in, in, with both inseparably, inseparably connected to nature in the images included in this section. Andrea Chung's intricate and tactile collages elevates materials of the everyday and the natural world while reclaiming history, slavery, medicine, connections to the motherland, and how Black women continue to serve as the protectors of mothers, women, and babies. Through the use of collage, found objects, and magazine cuttings, artist Wengechi Mutu creates portraits that further explore colonialism and the impact of medical apartheid on Black women. Notions of dignifying the ordinary are further developed by Dan Lawson and Michelaine Thomas, who reveal the divine matrilineal legacy of Black people and Black women in particular to locate, quote, the magnificent and have it come through in the picture, end quote. Placing Black women in control of their image and legacy by unraveling false histories connected to place can be seen in the works of Nona Faustine and Samantha Box, who describes how, quote, in, chaos of these, in the chaos of these slippery in intersections, there, can, there is a chance to measure my naughty personal ancestral and historical narratives, end quote. While partaking in memory work, Ayana B. Jackson evokes history through unearthing links to the past, unveiling and questioning what she has been taught to forget. In their photographs and three-dimensional creations, Vanessa German and Mary Sabande create a world that is reaffirming, exploratory, and fantastical, 
And this world, which incorporates elements of Afrofuturism, articulates a present and future experience that insists on the presence of Black women and girls made by Black women and girls. The artists in this special section serve as talisman, conjuring maternal and matrilineal legacies while reclaiming the innate Black br brilliance of Black women through personal stories, history, political acts, connections to place, moments of pleasure, and communal celebration. Research for this volume began in 2018, and throughout its creation, we were working together, but in our separate households, less than a mile apart. Our separation was due to the global pandemic that left the world with no choice but to bear witness to the murders of Black men, women, and children. As we hear the voice of George Floyd crying out for his mother with his last breath, Black mothers have not only been summoned at the moment, but have been answering this call as community anchors since time immemorial. Black mothers continue to be the truth bearers, showing us all another way of knowing, another way of knowing. Will we listen? <laughs>
Oh, yes. Now we'll start the Q&A portion um, of our, our evening. I have some just initial questions, but if you guys have any questions from the audience, feel free to raise your hands and shout them out as well. Uh, but thank you, Leslie and Zoraida, for joining me tonight. Uh, your project is phenomenal. This book is just the, the amount of work, the volume of work in it, and the, the, the thinkers and the, the, people, the writers that you have, Renee Musai, like, just incredible, it, you know, lots of international contributors as well, which is just fantastic. Um, so really, I hope you're super proud of this Thank you. massive project. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I hope I hope that many photography education schools, universities adds this to their curriculums. Um, I think it's a really important book. Um, I can't really think of a book before this that sort of tackles this subject in in such an in-depth way. But were there any books that sort of inspired you guys in terms of format or? Um, of that you know that you sort of looked at before while you were making this book. Um, as we mentioned, the We Wanted a Revolution. Yes. So yes. that source book, like Lizzie said, the source book. I, like my copy is just so worn, such a worn copy, and that um, you know really kind of opened things up. I I feel like there were different shows that um, were really influential. I remember seeing like Carrie Mae Weems show at the Guggenheim and that was so big. Cause I think for so many black women and girls, you don't have references of black women or girls making self portraits. Like you have the Toy Ruby Frazier and you have Carrie Mae Weems and seeing that show there was, you know, was really, really huge for me. I just wanna also add we're so happy the book has been made available um, open access through grants through the publisher Leuven and Knowledge and Latch. So that was a really big deal for us yeah. to know that regardless of the cost, you know, it can be downloaded. And uh, in fact, we've heard from several people they will be adding it to a curriculum, which is just such an honor. Yeah. It's so incredible to us because, as you said, the different voices and the essays are some key voices on the subject. So. So everyone knows it's available open access, which is such a, a thrill. And then in terms of books, so the source book, if, if you if you all are familiar with that we're talking about, it's really just um, Xerox copies and photocopies of the way they um, of old of essays referenced in the show. It's really lo-fi. It's a it's, it's a it's not anything. The structure is completely different than this. So that was kind of an inspiration for a next iteration. The dream is, you remember when you were younger, some of us in the room, you would go to the library and you'd open the back of the bibliography and go through the footnotes and then just begin the trail. That's kind of our goal for this, that everything referenced in this book would have something like that, like a, to accompany this book. Um, I think in terms of not structure, I think the structure, we really came up with that yeah. on our own. There's five sections um, covering you know, different um, historical information, digital culture, um, maternal health, um, art, photography. Um, and then we did really guard that last section of the book for a curated, we're, re we're really interested in curating our own little bit in the back, um, which we're really excited about. And then in terms of reading, one for me personally, um, Dorothy Roberts is someone who I've turned to quite a bit. There's a book, Killing the Black Body. And then this essay that I've read so many times, um, it's called Racism and Patriarchy and the Meaning of Motherhood. It's from 1993, University of Pennsylvania. It's just this phenomenal piece of writing actually reminds me quite a bit of some of your, you know, the work that you were talking about. Um, and then of course, Jennifer Nash, um, uh, I believe the book, most recent book is um, Birthing Black Mothers. So, but those are more academic books. There's not, as far as I remember, not image-based, but you know, definitely in the same in the space. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, each section of the book in the title mm -hmm. references a Black woman author yeah. or an important body of work. So it references like June Jordan, Alice Walker, yeah, so um, Toni Morrison. And so we wanted to just reference these incredible women that have inspired us. 
Yeah, which is great because there's often such a connection between literature and photography mm -hmm. as well, especially in the works of the people that you've included in the book. Um, so that's a really lovely structure mm. um, that you guys have in the book. Can we talk a little bit about some of the sub-themes within the book? I think we sort of mentioned quite a bit sort of black maternal health, which is certainly a, an issue that's coming to the forefront mm -hmm. in the last few years. Um, but yeah, what are some of the other sort of the sub themes in the book that you guys talked about and touched on within the work that you showed? You know, I think, um, especially as a black mother, it was really important to show that black motherhood is also joyful. Mm -hmm. Like it is beautiful, and <clears throat> joyful, and black mothers are also women and. Um, black mothers are these like independent beings. And um, Lizzie and I, it's funny, on the drive up, we were talking about some of um, uh, an old PowerPoint, an old presentation we used to give. And we used the word resilience. And Lizzie said, oh, I changed it. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm so glad. Like, I'm, I'm so glad you caught it because just this idea of black women needing to be resilient. And as you said, like a strong black woman and how black um, mothers and mothering. So the, I think it's really important to know that we're not just talking about biologically birthing, it's also about like mothering community and community comes in, in so many different forms. And um, to me that is just so important to show that like black motherhood is multidimensional. And two other themes, I'm just looking at it now. There is there is a section, the second section, devoted a little bit to more historical archival images. And one thing that came up, which we loved, was um, thinking about black women photographers as early entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. entre entrepreneurs and having studio spaces. Mm -hmm. There's an article about some, uh, a mm -hmm. um, And um, other one by Dr. Emily Brady, um, I like to make pictures of children, African-American women, uh, photographers wielding the weapon of motherhood. So thinking about the roots of WPR was really thinking about ways in which women have access in different ways than their male counterpart. And this essay was a, a deep and long essay, but uh, really highlighting how um, black female photographers were innovators in the field as well and their access to family life in the photographs. And then Marley, of course, yeah. I'm talking about Marley's essay was super important to us as well. Yeah, Marley is um, a, a friend I've known for many years and a writer. Um, she is in Amsterdam, but she talks about uh, social media and sexuality and um, kind of her journey through motherhood too. It's a really nice essay to include. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me a little bit of so something as a photography space, and we all love photography so much. One of the things that we neglected to mention was choosing which images should go in the in the books. We took a few chances. One of the essays is a really powerful piece about um, you know welfare queen, digital life, culture, culture memes, derogatory memes, and um, in the original essay, of course. It, as an academic essay, it was a reproduced, and we, along with the essay, has just decided we don't need to reproduce these. Yeah. If you want to see these, you know to go where to go find them. They're referenced. She describes them, and that felt like a really powerful decision that kind of set the tone for the rest of the book. Um, so these things are mentioned, and of course we have to reference, and but we don't need to reproduce necessarily. Um, and then also you'll see in the book that we. Asked, I think we showed a few, um, some of the authors, the Tillits and um, Regine. Regine and a couple of the other author, authors, they made reference to their mothers or child and we wanted to have some personal pictures too. Um, yeah, maybe going on too long about that, but we're really proud yeah. of that. We're really proud of asking for those and people being sure and telling us stories about their mom seeing the picture in the book and just mm -hmm. thinking, why is that picture in this book again? <laughs> oh, that's great. Because you know? <laughs> moms, are, moms are the word, you know, yeah. that's where it's at. Thank you. Um, were there any surprises that came up in terms of connections between artists' works or just things that you didn't expect maybe initially in the organizing of the book? You know, I was surprised that everyone said yes, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah um, because you just, you don't expect people to say yes, and, you know, Leslie and I, we're just plugging away, doing our work, we don't, 
we're not influencers or, um, and everyone said yes. And we were just pleasantly surprised. I remember there were, there were days where we would send out an email and then like two seconds later, someone would respond and we're like, oh my God, I, know. I can't believe they emailed us back. And so that was just such a really, really uh, yes. pleasant surprise. Yes. Yeah, I, I won't say who, but my absolute idol since I was 17, waited the longest to ask, but it was a key image for I won't say where in the book. And I was walking my dog in the woods, as we do in Beacon, apparently a lot. <laughs> she called my phone and I missed the call. But it was so beautiful. Like, this is it. You know, people are really excited about yeah. this project. And this is someone who was making work about this topic so many long time years ago. People are excited. They want to, you know, they want to get involved. I mean, when we were in London at the Tate, you presented the paper on this project. Um, a couple of years ago, we saw Mary Sabande's work mm -hmm. at the um, what's that Somerset place? House. Somerset House, and her work. If anyone has not seen her work in person, that was just something that we knew. And her work is primarily three dimensional and photographed, um, so that was something that we didn't expect. And that was someone we knew we wanted to bring in. Her slide was the last slide that came up, the purple and red. So I don't know if that's a connection, but it was an exciting moment. Yeah, no, it must have been exciting to have some of the powerhouses that you have in the book. Deb Willis, Carrie Mae Weems, yeah. early Carrie Mae Weems photographs. Yes. Like, yeah. that is gems. Yeah, mm -hmm. some really yeah. interesting little gems. I think there were, you know, I would say there's one, you know, there's just like often, they're sad connections. So like the, how the Moynihan report yeah. just yeah. keeps on coming up over and over again. You know, you see Carrie Mae Weems talking about it in her work. And then you see um, no, like 30 years later, Nona is talking about it in her work. And it's still this report that really um, haunts and just um, um, diminishes Black women and Black families. Um, what is there another edition coming? Is there were there anything was there anything left out that you didn't? Uh, I feel like it's. I mean, you just probably scratched the surface, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know that thing. I see you looking at me. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like work-life balance. What is yeah, that? Yeah, you know, what yeah. is that? We would do a million projects together. Like we also. We would just do this yeah. all the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like all of these things are just seemingly getting worse, mm. right? You mentioned the Moynihan mm -hmm. report. These, these in the news right now, uh, the, the family down in Texas where their child taken, mm. um, with child protection services, those kinds of stories with black families in particular, black mothering, the surveillance of black mothering, like all of these mm -hmm. stories. I guess it's where your radar is, but there's so many more things we could be talking about, but we just couldn't do everything in one book, right? This is, we really think about this, I think we were talking earlier, who's the audience? And you know, I'm my whole world is in photography. Yeah. I don't speak for me personally, but um, you know, I'm always thinking about photographers, artists, um, how we would look at images together, but it also lives in public health. We've had people use the book for public health, for feminist studies, for African-American studies, anthropology, you know, it covers so much, right? Would you agree that we're just like touching the surface? I think, so. yeah, we're just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, and I'm saying this on the way up too, I would love to include more house mothers, right? Like more genderqueer artists, mm -hmm. more house mothers, and talk about mothering through Picking Black Girlhood. I've just met like amazing just amazing young photographers that are um, mothering in their communities in just beautiful ways. And that's something I would, you know, like when we do a show, I'm not saying if, when we do our show, they will, you know, they, they'll, they'll, they have to be a part of it. There's have a lot of ephemera, a lot of books, a lot of yeah. Things, yeah. objects, yeah. prints. Yeah. CPW. Sure. <laughs> um, I'll open it up to the floor and see if there's any questions from the audience. No pressure. Yes, so tired of. I don't know. I guess I think it's great. Like, sometimes, like, we're important. Like, 
let it, let it go on. There is a child, there is some child. There's a, whole, a high profile, a profile, a low profile, low key. I think that's a beautiful thing, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask you about the show, and I'm sure you, in the future that will happen and it will be interesting. I was also going to ask you if there's any artists that you like to discover and see what you're out, and you wish, oh, if we've known about this person, and we'd love to do that. Yeah, you know, I would um, love, you know, like Miranda Barnes. We talk about like Miranda Barnes would be amazing. Um, someone who's in the in the girlhood show that I work with, like Jada Rodriguez. I would love to have her in the show. I mean, they're just. I feel like we're constantly, you know, early days of WPR, just like collecting, you know, tagging yeah, and so keeping things. So many artists are in the, there's a bunch of artists in the UK. I can't believe mm -hmm. London. Yeah. I mean, it's just so strong. Yeah. Yeah, there's more. Yeah. Blanking on names kind yeah. of at the moment, but. No, Instagram is a great place of discovery still mm -hmm. for artists. Any other questions? Yeah, what about you? When's, when's the book coming out? When's what the book coming out? Book? Yeah. What book? Oh, my Dodge and Bird book. I've been working on that for six years now. Yeah, yeah I was pregnant with Imogen when I got. The, the book contract and that just came about, um, I was actually reviewing books. I was doing a peer review of other photography yeah. books. And then the editor was like, wait, you have a blog. Do you want to publish the book? Mm -hmm. I was like, what? <laughs> so, um, but have been working on that for a long time and have had multiple editors, and, but also life keeps getting in the way. Other work keeps getting in the way. Yeah. My own artwork keeps getting in the way. So I'm trying to, Make that a priority this year for mm -hmm. sure um but i'm not putting any dates to paper yet <laughs> but yeah no i'm hoping to, to get it done this year and for folks who don't know the blog can you explain because it's quite a it's contribution a it's a yes it's dodge and burn good. so dodge and burn um is a blog that i wrote for about 10 years um on and off it was definitely a labor of love uh, it was a way for me, I have a completely whole other career in digital marketing, specifically in search engine marketing, mm -hmm. um, working in corporate America for 20 plus years now. Um, and it was a way for me to kind of get back into photography after feeling completely left out of it um, and just dis disconnected from it mm -hmm. um, and started blogging like during my lunch breaks, um, at, at one particular job that I had. Um, and um, and started started the blog as a way to sort of educate myself as well because um, I formally trained in photography, did black and white darkroom as a, in high school for three years, and then color photography in college for three years. And um, in you know in all of that education, felt like there were just a lot of voices missing. Um, and during a one on one with um, my professor in college one day I said, are we ever going to look at the work of black photographers besides Gordon Parks and, um, you know, other Latin American photographers, Asian American photographers. And he was like, oh, yeah, why don't you go to the library and look up Lorna Simpson and Carrie Mae Weems? Fortunately, my library went to Sarah Lawrence in Westchester. Fortunately, they did have their books. Um, and so I was able to discover those two photographers on my own, but we never addressed anybody else in class. It was always, you know, the typical road trip photographers that we looked at. Um, and so it was, for me, it was really a way to kind of educate myself, um, which oftentimes you have to do when society doesn't support you, right? Um, and eventually it became this place, this platform where I was like, okay, I'm gonna interview photographers. I'm gonna ask them how they got their start because every, every photographer has a different story, um, which is really fascinating, a different story about how they came to photography, what, who gave them their first camera. My, I got my first camera, a Minolta X700 through a house parent of mine. I went to boarding school in Troy, New York. And, um, I needed a camera for black and white photography 101 and I didn't have one. I couldn't I also couldn't afford to buy one. And that's how I got my first camera. Um, but yeah, I wanted I really wanted the interviews to be a place where 
you know, other photographers of color could come and learn about people who are doing the same thing or just as obsessed about photography as they were um, and have been able to really meet and connect with photographers all around the world through that blog, uh, which is which is fantastic. It was something that I never expected. And this was a time when blogging was really popular. <laughs> now it's you know, now it's all about micro blogging and social media. But um, yeah, so it's it'll be nice to kind of make the book be a final chapter almost of that work um, over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the book will be interviews and images, or you can't say? The book will be interviews, okay. definitely. Um, essentially just putting the blog to print form, which is nice. Um, and the blog has, has been used um, it definitely in several photography curriculums. Um, people have emailed me and told me that. But um, hopefully as a book, as a printed book, it'll also, and, and because Rutledge is an academic publisher as well, hopefully it'll get kind of more circulation um, through the college and the university circuit. And there are times to Kiana will say, if I Google a black photographer yeah, or a Latinx right. photo photographer, Dodger Burn is the first thing that comes out. I mean, it really is this incredible resource. And you, you know, I was telling Lizzie on the way, like I met Lola Flash through you and we're such good friends, you know, and um, you are really like a hub, you know, you, you connect these photographers together um, that form really meaningful relationships. Thank you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Appreciate it. I was talking to Elia Alba the other day, sorry, um, who's a Dominican photographer that I interviewed early on. And I met her for the first time in person through a German artist who was here in the US the other day. And she was like, oh my God, you're Kiana, you're not in Bern. Like, <laughs> your blog was everything for photographers yeah, back then. Yeah. I'm like, wow, no, it's, it's nice to hear. To hear that um, sometimes when you work online, you don't get to that that face to face a lot. So, you had a question. I just wanted to ask: Could you talk a little bit about what women fiction revolution is and how it worked a little bit? Yeah. So, um, women picturing revolution really uh, focuses on women identifying lens-based artists <clears throat> that document conflict, and conflict can be kind of out in the streets, conflict, or it can be kind of conflict, quieter, private realm, realm domestic space conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, and so, we put together panels. We've curated um, panels at ICP, at MICA. Um, we have put together workshops. So we lead half day or one day um, workshops as well. Um, we conduct interviews with artists. Um, and But for the last few years, the focus you know, has been on the book. And I know both Leslie and I are kind of itching to get back to some of that core root WPR work. And this is sort of becoming a source book that the other one was looking before. I you wouldn't so say much. no, I wouldn't say um, I think the footnotes in here could be the source book. Yeah, I think the footnotes in this because there's so much juice in like in footnotes, right? Um, I think that would be our source, our, our black mothering source book. Yeah. I mean, we're really looking at, you know, it's just really just time. This just took a lot of time and now we're out talking about the book, but I think we do have some things we're thinking about. There's all these artists working with environment and climate mm -hmm. and that's particular interest of Zoraida's um, that we would love to do another iteration of WPR in the classroom, which is time, you know? So now it's about if we're able to take the book to different places, maybe far away places, maybe we integrate a workshop, by the way, are we going to do that? <laughs> so, you know, if we're sorry, you know, if we're somewhere for a few days, it'd be wonderful again to have that. Cause it really is this thing where we get into conversation, you know, we lecture a little bit, we look at work and then we talk about the work. How are you feeling about Work. How's the work impacting you? Like a lot comes up, um, so that's that's what WPR is at the base. Yeah, and I think you know another um, strength of WPR is the artists that we feature and the conversations that we have are super intergenerational. Yeah, um, and I think that's something that um, 
I think both of us are just very proud of having these kind of cross sectional conversations and highlighting just artists from around the world of different ages is just really important to kind of who we are too. Yeah, that's something that we thought was missing too. That's just natural for us to want to listen to young voices and of all ages. I think there's a lot of focus on the in-between, but we've always been really drawn to that hearing from everyone. So yeah, I know it's we're talking for a while here, but questions? No. <laughs> I think we're getting close to time. Unless anybody has anything else, I want to plug oh. the oh. Just a question for the that are here, but where would they feel place to have the show Ooh, good question. Yeah, I think we have two ideas, right? Go. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we're, we're open to conversations about anything, because I think it could be many things, but I think like thinking about our lives and where we are right now um, for long term, because it's reinventing the wheel all the time is not sustainable. I, I personally would love to have a university that was really invested, build out the show with us, maybe a catalog, something, and then that show travels, because... Yeah. Also, we could do some community programming. That's super important to bring in the folks that are local, the students. I think that would be like a dream scenario that it travels and that maybe we can go lecture. But this notion that it moves without us and we're not trying to reinvent it every time. However, if you were in an art institution, which you've done recently, well, it's an academic. Yes, well. Rutgers. That visually sounds really interesting as well. So. And small places too. We're thinking about historical societies. Like what what is sustainable? Small little show that moves, the big art venues a different beast, and then the university. Yeah, and I, you know, I think um we both really want to have a traveling exhibition, but at a place that is also accessible to the subject, right? So a place where like um black women, black families, black people can look at the work and see themselves in the work. But, you know, we are open. <laughs> That's so exciting. Did you have Thanks a question? Asking. No? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I want to plug, actually, our next yeah. event that's okay. going to be online, right? Okay. University of Oxford panel. Um, that's Red and Leslie are okay. uh, going to host along with, the John, with Jonathan. So it's next Thursday uh, online, <laughs> Oxford University, and Dr. Emily Brady, who wrote in the book, invited us. Uh, and it will be uh, Jonathan Michael Square, who is this most phenomenal Follow historian, him. curator, beautiful online presence, fashion yourself. Yep. Um, and Kiana. Kiana. Kiana Mestri. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking about both their projects and their own work, but also focusing more on their contributions to the book as well. So we're really honored to, to be in that space, Rothmore American Institute. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you to you three. That was fantastic. And uh, we'll, put, we'll plug, uh, maybe you'll give us a link and we can put that online for uh, next week. Um, please join us. We're here every Thursday. Next week we have Naki Gornan and Oliver Wasso, who are actually the collectors that we are, um, that are on view right now. They have a fantastic collection, both of them of uh, photo booth pictures. So it'll be interesting to hear from them. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So many chords. <laughs>